Welcome to the first installment of the Peer-to-Peer -peer series here on SlickBot.net, and we'll start off with an introduction to the Peer Name Resolution Protocol, which really forms the foundation for all the things that we'll be doing building peer-to-peer -peer applications. So let's go ahead and dive in with a quick review. I'm sure most of us understand today already how the internet works, but let's just have a quick review so we can compare and contrast that to what we want to do with peer-to-peer -peer networking. Typically, we're in a very kind of client-server sort of arrangement here to use a broad brush where I am sitting at my laptop. I want to connect to some service on the internet at someservice.com, so I will go and talk to a DNS server and say, hey, where does someservice.com physically reside from an IP perspective? The DNS will give me the actual address, and I will go and connect to that service. And this works great because I have a fixed name. Uh, I have a fixed IP address associated with that name, and I'm also reasonably sure that someservice.com will always be available. But in the peer-to-peer -peer world, things are a lot different. I may be Bob sitting at my laptop, and I want to talk to Alice. So in some ways, this seems a little bit like the, the previous situation, where I want to connect to Alice and have Alice connect to me, and maybe I can accomplish that in ways very similar to what we saw with the DNS server. But what happens when all of a sudden I have many, many parties that I want to talk to, and any party may talk to any other party, and in addition, some of those people may be online, some of them may be offline. This is really the problem space that we're going to look at and try and solve and build different types of applications that use peer-to-peer -peer technology. So based on what we just said, you may think to yourself, well, I can solve that problem using dynamic DNS. And if you're not familiar with that, what would basically happen is, is Bob is interested in talking to Alice. And so when Alice would come online, she'd be able to go out to the dynamic DNS server and register, hey, I'm Alice, and here's my IP address. And then Bob could go and see, hey, is Alice online, and or basically ask for Alice's IP address, not really if she's online, but ask for her IP address. And if she has one, then I can go and talk to her directly. This actually has a couple different problems. Uh, the first is that when I get lots of clients, um, dynamic DNS really isn't dynamic enough to support uh, lots of clients. Here I'm showing only five, but imagine hundreds or thousands. And so what happens is they're all going to register. They can be coming online and offline. And we have this whole how do I replicate and propagate those DNS addresses fast enough so that Bob has a relative good chance of knowing if someone's actually been registered and is online or is offline and you know their IP address is no longer valid, etc. The other problem is, is that this doesn't solve the problem of these clients. Alice, for example, being behind um, a NAT device, for example, how do you register your IP address and have all of that work cor correctly across a NAT or some kind of firewall type of device? And PNRP will help us solve some of those problems, both from the dynamic nature of this world and also help us work with some things like NATs, for example. So at the end of the day, this is just not uh, the solution we're looking for. So what you typically see happen uh, for, let's take a chat application, is what will happen is, is when Bob wants to talk to Alice, what's going to happen is there's going to be some intermediary at chatservice.com. And what will happen is both the, the participants or any of the participants will go to a DNS server and say, hey, I want to have a chat. Where's my chat service reside? And then they'll go and connect up to that chat service and basically announce, hey, I'm online. And then Alice could do the same thing. I'm online now as well. And then they could communicate. And typically what happens is this is actually a relay through chat service. So they're not talking to each other directly. Now, there are ways around this. Some services provide the ability to eventually transition that connection to a direct connection between Bob and Alice, regardless of NATs and firewalls and things like that. And we'll, we'll talk about those scenarios uh, much later in some of the future screencasts that I'm going to do. But fundamentally, just kind of think of the fact that we're always passing through this intermediary. And really, I'm still dependent on the same things that we had from the earlier discussion, which is I'm I need to have a fixed name, like chatservice.com. I need to have a fixed IP address, relatively speaking, registered in the DNS. And then I have to have some level of assurance that chat service will always be available to me for me to talk to anyone, not just Alice, but anyone who I'd like to chat with. So lots of different things there. For large-scale applications where I have tons of infrastructure and I'm a Microsoft or a Yahoo or whoever, you know, running these intermediary services are, are fine and make sense. But for individual developers where we want to create compelling applications, again, this is just not a great solution to have. I don't want to have to build and maintain infrastructure. I want clients to be able to talk to each other directly across the internet. 
So let's take a look at this from a PNRP perspective. What does this provide? Well, what PNRP is, is think of it as a cloud, and it's an IP6-based technology. And what we're able to do is actually register into this cloud that I'm online. Now, if you're running IP4 or your provider only does IP4, if you have IP6 installed in your machine, we're actually able to tunnel the IP6 information through IP4 and kind of make this all work also. But this allows me to go and register in the cloud and say, hey, I'm online. And Alice can do the same thing. Now, what's really cool is it doesn't have to just be a person. This could be any application. It can represent an app, a person, my desktop itself, or my laptop itself into the cloud. It's really kind of up to you for what this registration actually means, but what you're doing is essentially associating a name with an IP endpoint. And so what Bob can do is go and ask the cloud, hey, is Alice online? And if she is, PNRP will return uh, an IP address and a port and, al uh, and allow him to go and connect up to Alice and, and directly communicate with her, even if there's NATs in the way. Now, symmetrical NATs kind of break this, but the, those are a little harder to find nowadays, a little bit older technology. And the nice thing about PNRP is, is that it's very quick and responsive. So as Alice and Bob come and go offline, I don't have to worry about propagation, really. It happens very quickly, the state changes that happen in various on nodes that are online. So the question is, well, what's this zero dot Bob thing? Why are you using zero dot Bob? Why can you just say Bob? Why can you just say Alice? Well, this is a unique naming convention that we refer to as a peer name, and it's actually made up of two distinct parts. The first part is the authority, and what the authority basically does is tells us whether this peer name is secure or not. Unsecure peer names always start with a zero, which means anybody could be zero dot some app anywhere in the cloud because it's unsecure. Then there's this classifier, which uniquely identifies a peer name within a particular authority. Now, as I said, this is an unsecure peer name. We also have secure peer names, and you can see they look much different. So here is my app. They could just as easily be some app. But then we've got this long string of characters in front. That's still the authority in the classifier. It's just that the authority in a secure peer name is based on a secure hash of the classifier. And that's unique to the laptop or the desktop or the server or whatever that that peer name was created on. So if I create my app as a secure peer name on my laptop, and you create my app as a secure peer name on your laptop, the authority will actually be different because we use some uh, keying technology to make sure that it's unique and specific to a, a particular machine. So very useful to help make sure that when I do connect to my app, I know that, okay, it's my app from this particular machine. And we'll look at different ways to use you know, secure and unsecure peer names as we work our way through this series. So it then brings us this idea of clouds. I mentioned the PNRP cloud to begin with, but there's actually different types of clouds within PNRP. There's a, what's called a global cloud and a link cloud. And what can happen is, is a particular peer name can go and register into the global cloud, which basically represents the entire internet. So anyone who wants to find some app could find it from anywhere on the internet. And there's this also link local cloud, which is really kind of related to the direct subnet that your particular adapter is connected to. So if I had multiple adapters in my machine all connected to a network, so if I was sitting down my wireless card was talking to one network and I had a hard line connected to a different network, I'd actually have two distinct link local clouds. And I can register an application into that. I can also register an application into all the clouds. So when I create an app, it's available to anybody, either from an internet perspective or from a link local perspective. And that is just a way to kind of differentiate on how you want to register your names, where they exist, and who can find them. So why don't we do some demos and take a look at using PNRP at the command line so you can kind of see how this all works.